I hope your conference was well. I had a lot of fun here this year, and let's hope that this talk will make you learn something new, maybe. So I'm just going to talk a bit about myself. I work as an IT technical consultant, which is just fancy words for like people coming up to me and say that they have problems and that they, I, can, I need to bring them solutions to them. Well, inside my company, we build products in the field of engineering. Um, some are related to rapid uh, seismic risk evaluation for buildings and rapid infrastructure assessment and monitoring. Many bridges, um, that's it. I don't know if someone knows where this place is. Can someone guess it? Maybe? It's Turin, we're in Italy, so that's why we're using, we're doing things, stuff on bridges, because here is such a hot topic at the moment. So these are some places where you can travel to in Italy if you're interested. And if you'd like to move to Turin, just give me a call afterwards and we can talk. And uh, um, this is the schedule that we're going to see today. So we're just going to have a quick introduction on server sent events. Uh, we're going to see a bit more about their inner workings. Uh, we're going to have a look at the differences from web sockets. Uh, and just going to see how a generic implementation could be done for a, for a generic HTTP server in Python, but it's actually for a generic web server. And then I'm going to just talk about some use cases. So I'm just going to have to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, has everybody, someone, so raise your hands if you have already sent data from the server to your client somehow. Okay. Uh, who of you have used WebSockets? Okay, a lot of you. And server sent events? Okay, good. This is a good opportunity then. I was hoping for that because as, um, as I recently discovered, it's a, like a technology that's basically unknown. So as you may already be aware, uh, these are the main mechanics with, with which you can send data from uh, uh, server to client, from server to client, which is polling, long polling, which is just basically an evolution, web sockets, and server send events. So with polling, you're like inside the dark ages. It's like a very bad idea. Uh, because um, each time that you need some data, you make a continuous request to your saver, server, and even if you don't have data, you still make requests, and that's a terrible idea. It doesn't scale well. It's very bad. And then somebody thought about long polling, which is slightly better, but uh, like you just um, you make a request to your server. The server keeps the connection open. When it has some data, it writes it inside your request, and then it closes it. And then you establish a request once again. So you basically just resolved a bit of the problem, not the entire problem. And then you have uh, WebSockets, which are the new cool thing in town. And uh, they are more very popular, easy to use with Node.js, for example, that work like right outside of the box. Uh, with Python, I don't have that much luck. Mm. You have to use uh, uh, libraries for your, uh, uh, for, your, uh, for your applications, especially if you're using uh, Flask, Django, Turbo Gears, Pyramid. Um, I don't know about Tornado, but uh, that's, I, I can't comment on that one. Uh, well, I think IO has them. I've used them before. I'm sorry, but I scrapped them for WebSockets. They work better. I don't know now how, how, how the state of the library is. And then there's server sent events, which, well, basically, um, to give you an idea, server sent events were born, the specification was born in 2013, and web, web sockets came along in 2011. So basically, that's why you maybe might not have heard until, uh, about it, because um, web sockets gained quite a lot of traction as soon they, as they came out, because there was nothing on the market that to do something so good in the way that WebSockets did it. And they kind of remain inside of the other corner. So this is basically the, uh, the communication pattern that you, that you have, like the, the problems and the issues. Like you can see that with polling I already explained, you have a lot of, uh, uh, you have a lot of, um, you, you use a lot of resources just to, co to create and uh, the connection because TCP has its handshake which uh, uses a lot, a lot of time. Uh, long polling, 
it's basically a bit better. And then there are server-side events, and the web sockets basically do the same thing, just keep an active connection. Um, so this is like the most simplest way in which you can use uh, service and, and events. You just have the event source API, which you can use inside your browser, inside your JavaScript. And you just can subscribe to an event which is called message. And that's the, like, the simplest Python Flask example which I could find. But of course, it's not working. I deliberately uh, wrote uh, blocking data store uh, source because I think that the example where you find uh, a while true loop and they just echo messages to you is like an anti-pattern because with this type of services, you should obviously get data from somewhere like, I don't know, a queue, Redis maybe. Uh, so someone before us talked about uh, um, Kafka, which is also a message queue, so something like that. Or even your database, if you fancy doing that. You could also do it with this. And there may be some use cases for that. So a bit more on, uh, on server service and events uh, on the JavaScript side. So you can see there are some available handlers which are uh, unopened, unmessaged, and unerror. These, uh, these are, um, they call them properties. I think they're functions uh, defined on the event stream uh, on the event source uh, um, object. And, uh, um, but I do not advise using them because server sent uh, events uh, specification um, allows you to define your custom events. So you'd like some things to have add event listener, let's say like uh, client connected, client disconnected, that's a very bad example. Uh, but, uh, so you can do it like that with message on error and open. So, these are some popular frameworks that I mainly used, and there are some a bit how to do this with all of them. For example, Turbo Gears 2, you just have to, in the expose method of your, uh, of your controller, you just have to add the content type text event stream, and that will enable for you the um, um, streaming from the Turbo Gears. Flask, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, if you return a generator, it automatically enables event streaming. I'm not sure. Um, Pyramid actually does it in a very explicit manner. And uh, AOHttp, I just found out that you have to use a library, but basically you can do it. In, we'll see how to do it with all of them, maybe. Um, so let's have a little bit uh, more uh, deeper look inside of, of how this, what's uh, this specification all about and what do we have inside it. So, um, if you have a, a generic server that, let's say, whatever you like to use, um, I don't know, pick one, let's pick Flask, because it's maybe one of the most popular. Um, you just, basically, the server has to respond with these three headers, which are content type, text, event, stream, cache control, no cache, because it doesn't make any sense to cache data for such an endpoint, and connection keep alive. Data is always encoded in UTF-8, and that's a requirement, and clients expect you to receive data, to send data to them that's encoded in UTF-8. And uh, the, the, the body of the you know, request works like this. You, have, uh, you, have, you write inside the body, whenever you have an event or whatever you'd like, a field, uh, colon, value, slash, and character, which is a terminator. That's basically how you write every type of event. And the events that are defined are uh, the, the, the value of the field, sorry, which uh, is defined is uh, data, event, ID, and retry. So um, data contains actually the payload for your message, which you're sending. Um, the event name, it's what allows you to write uh, subscribe on message, add event listener for message. Here you can d uh, use um, event to define your custom message, and you pair it up with, with a, a data field. And uh, ID is an interesting one, because uh, I, never said it, uh, I never said it until now, but one great thing about server sent events is that it has, uh, you don't have to care about uh, reconnection, the browser does it for you. 
So basically, if you create an endpoint with server sent event, um, you just connect from the browser, your server goes down, as soon as it, get, it, it gets up, uh, the browser automatically checks for, for, um, for, um, for your server at set intervals of time, and it automatically reconnects to it. And the ID is a, a field which is used for synchronization of the messages. So you can actually um, quite easily implement a, a resync message so you don't uh, resync system or pattern in which you don't lose any messages that you are trying to send from your uh, server to your client. Because <coughs> if you have the ID header, the browser will automatically, the client will automatically add it back to you as a header, as a last event ID header, I guess. That's what I found out. Um, to the, to the, next, the next time it connects. So you automatically can recover this ID and maybe make a query to your database and get, get the appropriate event stream. Uh, and retry uh, is a value which you provide in milliseconds. It's basically the, uh, mm, the amount that the clients need uh, need to wait between reconnections. So um, this is how, how a data package should look like, like how data is formatted. You can see that uh, messages ending with double um, and slash n, which is in line, um, mean that the message is finished. So you can obviously combine the data, the ID, the event field together uh, the retry one, you just send it only once in a while when it makes sense for you. That's basically it. And uh, I also made a small example of a custom event listener. It's the same idea, the only thing that changes is the part of the, can you see the mouse? Of course not. Is the part of the, where the yield is and just added the message that has a, a, an event name. So a bit more on this uh, answer on the specification. Um, you can actually redirect the, the, the um, it, is, it is possible to make a redirect on the request. So if you have uh, like a move, you want to move automatically request to HTTPS, it's not a problem. Uh, as I said before, only UTF-8 encoding is supported. Uh, communication is only done in one direction. It's only server to client. You don't, have any, uh, you don't have any way to send data back from your client to the server, but basically that's what HTTP is for. You just make a GET request and you basically have the same functionality. You, but of course you have to make a new request with all, the, with all that means that you have to make a new communication channel. As I said before, clients always reconnect. You don't have to worry about that problem. And uh, if you expect for, a, if you want to shut completely down a client, you just reply with a 204 HTTP 204 code, no, no content, and your, uh, the browser or the client will stop uh, automatically reconnecting uh, to, um, to the service. Another thing to keep in consideration is that there is a, a limited amount of global connections per site. So that browsers, which browsers define actually uh, there was an open issue on Mo Mozilla and uh, Chrome, and they, uh, they've marked it as one fix because this is actually a feature. And uh, um, you are expected, so when you open a, um, a stream to service and events, you are actually using one of these connection slots, and I think that there are five. So you basically far, have four left at this point. So this could probably be, be an issue for you if you are like, try to open the same, uh, if you have the users that open your site on seven different tabs, that could be an issue. Someone pointed out that you can use a shared web, web worker and put your um, service, it, service and event inside that and use it to, and, you, and then talk to the, server, uh, to the, to the uh, web worker to recover your data. So you basically kind of fix the problem. It's a bit of a workaround, but it, it works. Um, let me see, oh, okay. Mm. So clients are always required to send a cache control, no cache header. And uh, the server always has, okay, we already talked about the server headers. As far as uh, of coverage goes for modern browsers, this was taken like two or three days ago. It's like 92.6%, which is quite good, I'd say. 
But if you, if you think that you are not in, uh, you have to support some older browsers, there are some polyfills. I think that this library is the most used one, the one that I linked in the slides. And you basically have support for server sent events on all browsers, except a couple of old Android devices, maybe. Of course, the, the main question, but do I use this thing only with a browser? Um, well, the answer is uh, uh, no. There are different libraries for different uh, languages. I just Google some up. There are links to them. And uh, basically, you can use it with, with Python, with Android, with iOS. I don't know, maybe some of you do mobile development. There's also the uh, React Native one. Um, just wanted to point out that the React Native one uses basically a polyfill, and which is just JavaScript. There's nothing, you don't have bindings to native Android or iOS. That could be an issue for you if you're trying to do something that works in the background. Um, you can't have it running when your application is closed because your, um, your, your JavaScript thread is closed at the moment when if you don't see your, your app in the foreground. So maybe you'd have to introduce something else. Um, so let's talk about maybe the main differences between uh, server sent events and web sockets. These are like maybe one of the clue parts. Okay, so one can only send UTF-8 encoded messages, which is server sent events. The other also supports binary data. You strictly use HTTP, while web sockets has a, a custom protocol which you have to manage. Well, libraries manage for you, but the protocol is much more complex than this one that you've seen here. Uh, so server sent events is uh, proxy friendly but that's just because it's a simple HTTP request. The other one, for, with, for example, with Nginx, you may have to uh, uh, add some headers, but with more modern uh, web proxies like traffic, you don't have this issue, so it's not that bad nowadays. Uh, uh, we already said that there's a built-in uh, mechanism for reconnection and also resynchronization of messages. Uh, web sockets need to manage the heartbeat, I had a lot of problems in the past with Heartbeat. I never managed to get it that right, so that was one of the issues for me with them. Uh, okay, um, server sent events is like really hard to detect uh, these connections on server side, so I didn't talk about it. I'm just gonna go back because I wrote it in an unfortunate place. If you send a message, start with, with uh, comma and then something on your inside your response, it means it's a comment. This is basically how you can check for the presence of your client from the server. You just send uh, at the regular intervals of time just a, a small comment. It's like the heartbeat for server side, okay, in, in the WebSocket protocol. Okay, of course I messed it up. Um, um, of course, uh, um, WebSockets fully detect uh, errors, uh, disconnections on client and server side. Um, we talked about the server uh, the direction of communications. Uh, okay. So some use cases, maybe, some that are more adequate for this technology. Let's say you have a dashboard that you need to update once in a while, maybe a news feed that some, uh, every once in a while news comes to your, to that, uh, to your, um, something needs to get published to, to your web page. Um, notifications to browser, that like push to browser, that could be, I, I think it's me, right? Okay. And maybe games, so for the purpose of this demo, to really try out the technology, I set myself on building a game with this thing, so I really got to, to figure out how worse it got. It could, it could get, I actually was, I kind of cheated a bit because I made a game that wasn't that real time so I didn't need web sockets. But as I found out today, there are like technologies that if you need to make games like uh, Socket.io, I don't know if you already seen the talk today, that's like a real good one because it manages also these connections for you, it does a lot of things automatically. So basically, mm, if you want to, if you have some old code, you can't set up new things, you want to do something really quickly that is quite widely, support, widely supported. 
uh, and you need to send data from your server to, to your client, just evaluate if you can uh, ha manage to implement server sent events. That they could be an alternative, and they have less way headaches than uh, web sockets, especially scaling web sockets. This uh, scales with your application. You have less dependencies, and uh, that's all. Uh, you can find some links that I've used to compile this uh, presentation that could be helpful. And uh, some takeaways. Okay, so I just already said them. That's all, thank you. Okay. Questions? Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, so, except for the fact that the client automatically reconnects, how does this, um, how is this different from long polling? Could you tell a bit more about yes. that? Yes, okay. Just get, let me get the slide up. In long polling, you have like, you can see long polling is the, the second line. When you create a connection with long polling, you make a request, okay? So the, the request rem remains pending on your server. And as soon as some data arrives, you, you just write the data to the request and close, the server closes the request, okay? So the clients, as soon as the, uh, the request closes, the client automatically restarts a new connection to your server and then it awaits again for data. That's basically uh, the difference that you are looking for. So, so you know, f in the case of server sent events, it reconnects only if some, like the internet dropped, uh, you entered somewhere, it, it, the connection stays up. That's how it works. Hi. Uh, regarding polling here, uh, it polling uh, releases the resources from the server, so the connection can be reused. So if you have a lot of uh, clients connected to your server, I guess with server send events, you have one connection open per client, like web, web sockets. So you mentioned that polling is very bad, but uh, how it can uh, help uh, in this problem when you have a lot of clients and you don't mind making connections to the server, and you can uh, let more clients served. Maybe a little bit slower, but they will be served. So you're, you're asking, uh, I'd like to stick to polling. Would it be still fine if I have the infrastructure to serve it? Like oh, uh, if I stick to polling, then uh, I can serve probably much more parallel clients. Okay, so uh, I won't uh, I won't get immediate responses because I have to poll, but uh, I will release resources on my server so they can somebody else can use the connection. Okay, um, let's say that you have a, a spike of traffic, a huge spike of traffic. Um, if you were uh, if you're using polling then you act automatically make a, a huge amount of requests. Maybe you have smart surfaces that automatically scale, and you're just going to get a super high bill. But with this one, you actually lower the amount of connections, like you only have one for um, connection. So you just have, only have one connection for... Yeah, uh, but one, per, one per connected device, if yes. I have only one per connected device, so we've which is permanent. Yes, of course, like with, socket, with web sockets. Yeah, but, exactly the same. But that actually, so um, I looked a bit into traffic. It automatically manages some of these connections for you, for example. So some web proxies help you with this. So it's not that such a big of an issue nowadays. I, I never tested it with quite a, a large amount of devices, but like for really small applications. Uh, well, I, I don't see wh why sh I should use polling nowadays because it's like um, it gives me a lot of problems. I have to think about, oh, okay, so if I mess up a time or if something goes wrong, I have all these requests in my log, which, logs which, which I don't understand what they are. So why should I use it when I have um, new instruments that, are, that already work kind of great from my perspective? And it's super easy to implement at this time. And you already have uh, an API which helps you to build something that is event-driven at this point. 
I think the drawback that he's mentioned is that for architectures that have sorry, a fixed I can't see you. sorry. I think the the, 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 drawback, the main drawback of, of this solution is that if you have an architecture with a fixed number of workers, you're going to run out of workers uh, uh, proportional to the number of connected clients, where it was with the polling solution, they would poll, get a no response, and then the workers would be free. So in, in a way, the, uh, uh, well, service I and events is superior to everything, uh, in, to all other solutions, except in this regard, where it shares the same problem as WebSockets. Okay, L let me cheat a bit. So you can, uh, if you're using Gunicorn or something else, you can set it up to use more workers. Like with G-Event, you use green threads, so you don't have, you don't notice so much, so much this problem. But I've never tested it under huge workloads. Oh, I would need to make a test with polling and with server sentiments to give you a, a better idea. So this could be like an, an integration to this talk. I, I'll think about it. So yeah, I want to add something because I had experience with uh, WebSockets previously. And for me, for example, polling is good when you can refresh your data every minute. So then you mm. don't have to connect to the server and keep connection connected all the time. But for example, I was working on the project when we needed real life, uh, real time data. So we needed that, that connection. And well, to be honest, we were able to handle like thousands of connections in a single async IO server. So well, that's not a big issue. And it works on one thread. Yeah? We have Gil and thousands of connections. So it's not a big problem. And well, basically, if you are using polling, you can, but your data will be outdated a little bit. So if you need real time, well, you have no choice. Okay, so I do agree with you on this one. So um, the, the same thing that you're doing with WebSockets, just to receive data, you can do it also with uh, uh, server sent events, and you can implement it also on top of a sync IO, IO if you have the same thing. The main advantage, I think, is that you have some legacy code somewhere, maybe you don't need to spin up a sync IO. Uh, an async IO app from, from, and have another dependency added to your project. This could be something that you may want to take into consideration. Yeah, I also get confused with the name, don't worry. Any other questions? If not, let's give a big round of applause for our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.